there goes our ride. Having just deposited the two of us, my wife and I, on a sliver of a bank of Southwest Alaska's Kulik Lake, and it's not the drop-off spot we hoped it would be. And then there's this. After the warmest, driest, sunniest May and June on record in Alaska, a drought, some were calling it, right on cue, we demonstrate our awesome rain-making powers. You're welcome. So, the plan is, catch an Alaska Airlines flight from Anchorage to the remote town of Dillingham, check, have Bay Air and Dillingham fly us and our stuff, including a 15 horsepower outboard and 20 gallons of fuel, to Kulik Lake at the top of the Wood River Lake system, check. And then, over the next few days, motor and float the 95 miles or so, the five lakes and five short rivers, to our pickup at the village of Aleknagek. Piece of cake, right? Our trip begins where many of these flyouts out of Dillingham often do, on Shannon's Pond. Notice they don't call it Shannon's Lake, but it is just big enough to get a float plane with 1,200 pounds of stuff and us into the air. And then it's north to Kulik. When we get to Lake Kulik, the weather is too windy and the lake is too rough to land at the beautiful drop-off and camping spot we discovered on an earlier trip, so we landed here. At an exposed bank with just barely enough room for a tent. So, whatever plans you have, write them in pencil, preferably on one of those waterproof notepads. The lakes and the weather will decide. And so here we are, waiting out the weather. Not the best first night camping spot that we've ever had, but at least the tent's up. And it was a struggle to do that with the wind, which has died off pretty significantly. After two nights here, waiting out the wind and the rain, we set off for the far west end of Lake Five, as the locals call it. As we near the west end of Lake Kulik and the outlet of the Wind River, we stop to check out the fishing at Creek Three, as we've labeled it on our GPS. Then we head across the lake for supplies. We were so disappointed in um, Dillingham that they didn't have ice that we spied these mini little glaciers and we're going to go over there and get some ice to put in our Yeti. That's where we're headed, just right across the lake. So Devin is just right over there chipping off some of this ice from this glacier. So we have it for our cooler because in Dillingham, believe it or not, they didn't have any ice. So look at that waterfall. Gorgeous. Here he comes. Build the Yeti. The Yeti's full of ice. <laughs> the moment of truth was counting on enough water with our tons of gear. Yep. Yep. At the bottom of the Wind River, 
we find a beautiful camp spot. And the weather is now warm and sunny. Tuesday night and we are at the bottom of the Wind River where it flows into McChalk Lake. After a very short day motoring down the short and narrow McChalk Lake and floating the languid and peaceful Peace River, we arrive at Lake Beverly. Yesterday we had been warned by a couple of rangers who flew in to check on us that there was some nasty weather moving in with sustained winds of 25 to 30 miles per hour and rain and that we should probably stay off Lake Beverly for at least a day if we have the choice. We decide to heed their warning. Brunch and conversation with the honey badger. <laughs> A little intimidated by the isolated and recently tempestuous nature of large Beverly, we break camp and make time while the lake is nice. The 15 miles, give or take, to the far east end of the lake and the top of the Agulipak River. And after a short float down the Agulipak, a campsite to remember where the pack flows into Lake Nurka, the large, somewhat confusing, dog-legged lake referred to as Lake Two by the locals. But more about that later. For now, it's a layover and a holiday. Sunday evening, July 3rd, at the mouth of the Gulapak, the outlet on Lake Nurka. And then, something that might compromise our image as rugged Alaskan survivalists? Our friends Tim and Jennifer dropped by for a visit, flying in with their Cessna from the Golden Horn Lodge a few miles to the north, and dropped off still warm caribou burgers. Warm from the grill, we're not savages. But we do enjoy a nice first world aid package. Up next, Lake Nurka. Head west for about 17 miles. And when the lake spreads out near the west end with arms poking back into the mountains to the north and to the west, make a hard left to the south. Maybe up here? Better check the GPS. As we get closer to River Bay, the end of our Nurka leg, and the outlet of the Agulawak River. All kinds of sockeye salmon here, rising like crazy.
When we reached the bottom of River Bay, we passed the GCI Lodge, and we begin to descend the short but surprisingly rambunctious Agulawak River. Arriving at Lake Aleknagek, we set out down the lake a couple of miles to a small island protected by a larger island nearby, a good protected place to set up camp. But the owners of this island, come to find out, were not very happy with our intrusion. After a very short break in the weather, of course it's rinse and repeat. We motor slowly into the off again, on again, wind and rain. And the closer we get to the takeout, the larger the lake seems, and the more the unpredictable weather reminds us how reliant we are on decent luck and reliable equipment, like that trusty outboard motor back there. We eventually make it, the 11 miles from the island to the village of Aleknagik. And finally, the next morning, we load our gear into a pickup truck and drive the one dead-end road that goes either into or out of Dillingham, the road that provides lake access to the massive Wood Tick Chick State Park to the north, the 24 miles back to the big town, the rural hub of Southwest Alaska and Bristol Bay. Population, around 2,200. 